Um, you'll see why it's called the infinite Dewey when we get there. And it's an introduction to natural language processing. Whenever I give one of these talks, I am always have this weird challenge that I have like 30 minutes to give you guys what is essentially like a semester course in natural language processing, and that is not possible. And so it's very high level, but I try to make it interesting, and I hopefully I've done that, uh, and give you an idea of where this kind of expands out to from the basics to more interesting things. Okay, so what is NLP? It's teaching a computer to understand language, and it's specifically natural human language or natural language processing. This is different from formalized language like we use for computers. Um, and it's, it's a classic trope for sci-fi. You know, you go onto your spaceship and you talk to the spaceship and it responds and it does what it's supposed to do. It's really awesome. And we're trying now to get there. This is spoken language with Amazon Echo, Siri, Cortana, um, OK Google, um, all that processing. We're trying to get there. And if any of you guys have used any of these products, you know that there is some limitations to how well they work. Um, and it's not as smooth as it's portrayed in a movie. So that can be a problem. So let's set some expectations about what you should get out of this talk. Uh, this is going to be about processing written and not spoken language. That's very important. And we're not going to really get into chat bots. That's a whole different realm of, of speaking into things. We'll talk a little bit, but not too much. There will be some math and code, because I like that. Um, we'll see if you do. And there's going to be an odd turn in the middle, because I like to do that in my talks. So we'll see how it goes. And also, it helps people to like wake back up. After about 10 minutes, your neurons kind of buzz out. So you need to take a turn. OK. So a natural language uh, NLP pipeline for a written kind of processing is we start with some text. Um, we tokenize the text. We create words out of it. So when I'm talking about text, I'm talking about like a string, if you're a programmer. Or it's like some, OK, hold on. That's super annoying, isn't it? OK, there's, now we're cool. Um, we're going to tokenize it, and then we're going to tag it. We're going to march, mark each of the tokens with a part of speech. And then we're going to chunk it. I love that term. We're going to parse out the sequences of tokens um, and kind of mark them at a higher level. So the text we're going to go with is uh, basically the Wikipedia text that describes what natural language processing is, right? So we'll start there. And we're going to try a tokenizer. So a real basic tokenizer, because this is a basic introduction, is we split on some white space. We gather the non-white space characters together as tokens, make the words. We do some special handling for punctuation. and. So as an aside, I used uh, a Jupyter notebook. I don't, if you guys are familiar with Jupyter, it's a pretty cool way to do some stuff with Python. This is all created in a Jupyter notebook. And then I had it converted to slides. So all the code is like actual code and the real output. If you're using Python, there's this great thing you can use called the Natural Language Toolkit. If you want to get started into natural language processing, I highly recommend it. And as you can see there, we set the text. Um, and then we call its tokenized thing. And the real point is to look at what the tokens are. There are a lot of what you would expect. Um, for example, you can see it's pulled out natural language. It's, it's made words like you would expect. You'll see around NLP, it's pulled out the uh, parentheses as their own separate tokens. And then the period and other punctuation are pulled out as their own separate tokens. Now we'll get into a tagger. So this is where it gets a little more fun. Um, how many of you remember like your sixth and seventh grade English classes where maybe you had to go and diagram a sentence? That's totally what we're talking about here. So we're looking at nouns and pronouns and prepositions, verbs, adverbs, all that sort of thing. And taggers depend on machine learning. And Part of that is because you need to learn how to tag the information correctly. So you use a feature set that's like, what's the previous word? What's the next word? What is the first letter of capital? And so on. 
Um, these can use decision trees, neural nets, um, naive bays, kinds of things. It's a pretty basic machine learning problem. But to train them, you have to have a hand-tagged data set. Uh, there's a thing called the pin tree bank tag set. So what that actually straight up is, is somebody went through and they marked each word and said, this is what I think that word is. And then it's this big data set and you run your machine learning over it and you use it to predict the tags. And so this is what we get with that. Let me see if I can get my cursor. There we go. So natural has been tagged. That JJ means that's an adjective. Um, language right there has been tagged. The NN means it's, it's a noun processing. And so on, you can see that there's a kind of a rich set of tags. Some things, they are themselves their own tag. And this is, this is how it's tagged. So this is straight up like you would do. You'd say, OK, this is my noun and all that sort of thing if you were doing this by hand. And then this information would get passed to a chunker. And it says, hey, given a group of tagged tokens, let's group them into more meaningful chunks. Um, and then we can group the chunks into larger expressions. This is a shallow parsing. We don't, do a, we don't necessarily have to do a full parse tree when we're doing this. And this can be done via a grammar. So this is a grammar to make a noun phrase. And a noun phrase, we could say, is composed of maybe a determinant plus some number of adjectives and then a noun. So give you an idea what that is. It could be wagon. It could be red wagon. It could be the red wagon. It could be a red wagon, or it could be the large red wagon. All those could be grouped up into a noun phrase. And it is next to impossible to create a full grammar for a natural language. And the reason this is, is in spite of what your grammar teacher may have told you, natural languages, the grammar is a descriptive grammar. It's not telling you how to make the thing. That's, that's done by your brain. It is reflective of how we find the grammar is actually used, and it actually changes. And spoken language is way worse than written language. In spoken language, it's all broken up. When people are talking to each other, they take shortcuts all the time. They don't say words. They miss words. There's a huge information exchange via nonverbal means. All this is happening at the same time. So verbal language is really hard to deal with, um, which is why when you speak to your phone or something, you have to be kind of precise about what you're saying, right? Because it can't see you. It doesn't know what's going on. Um, and this is just another problem. Like, it's really hard to do this because things that your brain thinks are acceptable for somebody to write or read and you can pull information from them, a computer is going to choke on. Most chunkers just do some small chunks. We don't fully parse everything. And natural languages have a lot of ambiguity. I can say the buffalo buffaloes buffalo, right? That makes perfect sense if you parse it in your head. Would it make perfect sense to a computer? Well, that could, be, that could be a problem. So they also, you can use supervised machine learning. And you can train a chunker by using tag chunks, just like the tagger, like the word, the lemma, that's the root, the position, the next word, next position, all that sort of thing. And at that point, chunking looks very much like tagging. You just have larger sorts of inputs. And here's an example of this. This is still. What we've done here is we've a very specific chunker. This is the named entity chunker. And it looked over that tag data, and it said, it looks like natural language processing is an organization. Which you're probably thinking, oh, that sounds silly. But it, it, what it's done is it said, this looks like an adjective followed by some nouns. And they're kind of grouped together. And you know, then there's this verb. So this is really like a whole chunk. Like this thing is you know, natural language processing is an entity, if you think about it. And that's what it's telling you. This is an entity. These aren't separate words. They should be together. All right. OK, so some of the uses for this. You can do sentiment analysis. That's like, hey, does somebody like my company? You can go through and look at tweets that have your company in them. And are they good tweets or bad tweets? You could do named entity recognition. Like, I'm looking over a document. What's this document talking about? What are the things in it? Um, does this tweet involve something I know about? Um, you could actually understand a verb and the object of the verb, and this could be used in a game that has a text interface. So 
One way to do a chat bot is you limit the vocabulary severely and you say, okay, I expect some sort of a like verb, noun, pair kind of a thing. Or you could use this and you could pull out, have it parse it and pull out the verbs and nouns and then see if they apply. You know, same sorts of things. Or it could be used for a simple command system. So all this, like this is free, you can download this if you know Python, you can, you can play around with this, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Now we're gonna, we're gonna take an odd turn. So that's, that's basic natural language processing in a nutshell. And it goes on from there, right? It's pretty simple. So let's talk about the Dewey Decimal System. So my wife has recently been taking some classes on becoming a librarian, and she had to learn about the Dewey Decimal System, and I'm sure you all know about it at some point. You've learned about this. And it, it's very odd in some ways. So it's a proprietary library classification system, which means you actually have to license it if you're going to use it. And it was first invented by Melville Dewey in 1876, and it's currently used in a lot of libraries in 135 countries, right? This is, this is a big deal. It's used in our library. And why is it important? Why would I even bring this up? Well, um, pre previously to this, this is how a library would catalog. You'd get your book in, and it'd go to the next open location on the shelf, and then in your catalog, you would say, that's where it is, right? And Dewey gave like a framework to put books together so that when books are near each other, they might be grouped by subject categories. This makes things easier to find. And because of this, books near each other are often related. Okay, so far so good. This, this makes sense to us. Um, topics are given this three digit kind of classification. Like if you wanna go down to Finsler geometry, I'm not even gonna explain what that is. Um, Right, it makes sense. You start with natural sciences, then it gets broken up into mathematics, and then geometry, and you go on down to, 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 until you get to Finsler geometry. So I want to introduce to you the concept of browsability. So when I go into a library and I'm looking up some sort of nonfiction book, what I like to do is find a book that seems related to the topic I want to know about. I go to that location on the shelf, and then I scan all the books near it to see if I can find something that looks interesting because I don't have enough information given to me by the library system to know if that book is interesting, but because they are grouped by the Dewey Decimal System, I have full access to all the books nearby. Like, in a computer sense, we have literally a physical cache where things that are like each other are grouped near each other, which is pretty cool, I think. Dewey's Downsides, it was designed in 1876, and it was designed with those ideas in mind. Um, the top Parts of the hierarchy represent the state of knowledge then. So maybe new stuff that we know about now is kind of crammed into a smaller section. Um, yeah, you, they try to expand it, but you can imagine libraries aren't really fond of somebody saying, hey, let's update your catalog system. And it doesn't really reflect modern cultural standards. This was designed when basically being a white Christian male was the top of the, of the heap and everything was built around that. But so let's get back to NLP. Why is this important? So how do we compare two documents? So step away from like understanding that something is a verb or an adjective. How do we compare two documents? How do we know that they are talking about the same stuff, right? Well, we can ask, well, do they use the same vocabulary? That's pretty much a clue. If they're both talking about dogs, they probably talk about dog stuff. In natural language processing, there's this idea of a topic model. And a topic model is essentially, if you're going to talk about something, a subject, you are going to use a certain vocabulary. And something else that talks about that same subject is going to use the same vocabulary. Okay. So why can't we just go into the document and we'll just count the words? Like, we'll see what words are being used. We'll count them up. And we could calculate distances. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's kind of like a stock portfolio, but instead of investing in stocks, maybe you're investing in words, right? That helps you visualize this. But what do I mean when I say calculate a distance, right? If we just count up the words. Well, this is basically a generalization of what we would consider a normal distance. Like I'm going to go downstairs and rent an electric scooter and I'm going to drive it to my house. Like how far is that? 
Of course, it's a lot of twists and turns. Right? It's not straight unless it's a very spectacular scooter. Um, so we could start with Euclidean distance. That's a Pythagorean theorem. There are other measures we could use. Um, there's a cosine or angle distance, so that's measuring the angle between two vectors. That's pretty cool for some things. There's a taxi cab or block distance. That's when you can't go straight, you have to go like, you know, around the blocks. There's actually many, many distance metrics. It's a whole, it's a whole science unto itself. And so let's just kind of go through this. So let's, I have this nice Python formula, and it's just the Pythagorean theorem, right? Pretty easy. And it's going to take the square root of this x. It's got these two points, and we're going to calculate a distance. And you can see there at the bottom it gave us a distance. That's cool, right? We're there. I, I hope we're all down with that because it's going to get weird. OK. <laughs> Well, so let's say I throw out x and y. I mean, it's just tags, right? I could say wind and rain. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing, right? We can see we can still calculate a distance. Well, we can say, well, what if those are two documents and we just counted up how many wind and how many rain references in the documents we got, and we calculated the distance. OK, that's cool. Now we can say, well, you know, I'll just keep expanding that. And now I'm adding like more words. What I'm really doing is calculating the distance in a higher dimensional space, right? Sorry. Well, yeah. So you, you can start calculating more words, and, and you can just keep adding words. And you can go to some sort of like, you know, an in-dimensional space, however big you want. And you can still, this still holds, which I think is really cool. Um, it's called the L2 norm, if you want to get technical. So we can get there, and we can still calculate our distance. This is all real code, no smoke or mirrors. But when we're work looking at a document, there's a lot of words in there we actually don't care because they have nothing to do with the topic model. Words like the and a and all sorts of just sort of uh, noise words. Um, they're very important for us to perceive like language as we're processing it, but they really have no bearing on this. So. We can drop the common words during tokenization. These are commonly called stop words, a, the, and so on. Um, I like, sometimes I do this myself. You go out and you just find the 100 or so most common English words and just say, if you see these, drop them out. Um, yeah, and they're so frequent that they provide little information. Actually, what they do is because they're so frequent and their counts are so high, the distance between those things actually overwhelms the distance between your words that you actually care about. So this is um, what an actual like a tokenization formula looks like, and it's you know it's just a regular expression. We split on the white space, strip some words out. I like to get rid of all the things that aren't letters for this kind of analysis because numbers aren't going to do you anything unless I guess it's a specific term that uses a number in there. Um, then drop everything that's not a letter, and anything that is less uh, less than two characters we throw out. Um, this is, so this is basically the same as what we saw before. This is just my own sort of hand-rolled tokenizer. Okay. So when we do this, we start to run into some problems, like what about synonyms, right? This approach has no concept of synonyms. If two words are two tokens, they are completely separate. And we could use a thing called WordNet to group words. WordNet is another open source thing that tells you kind of what words are and how they're related to each other, if they're synonyms or antonyms. It, it's hugely expensive to do that kind of analysis across a huge, a large data set. Or we can use word vectors. I don't know how many of you know what word vectors are. I could talk to you about them some other time. But um, that kind of casts words into a high dimensional space. And if they're close to each other, they're usually related somehow. But it, get, it can get a little weird for this kind of thing. Um, what about roots? So should we count the singular and plural of a word as the same word? Right? It might be useful. What about the present and past forms of a verb? Um, you can do this. It's called stimming for English. Typically, a thing called the porter stimmer is used. This is also, and you can go and download one for Python. It's very useful in some cases, but what it tends to do is it you lose the word exchange a weird form. Like instead of ending in a Y, it might start ending in an I because that's the stemmed form. And it doesn't always relate to what we would consider a root word. 
So can we, given all that, so there's some caveats, could we have more effective use of the information? Now, I want to say something about synonyms. Now, that may sound like a huge problem, like, oh man, it doesn't know what synonyms are. But typically, we're talking about a whole group of words. And you're not going to have like synonyms for everything in this paper that match stuff over here, right? They're going to have overlap in a lot of words, and it pulls that information. But we can be more effective in our use of information. We can change the word weighting. So basically, we take the count and we can multiply it by some sort of weighting. A real uh, frequent thing is called the term frequency inverse document frequency. Now comes some math. I know that looks scary, the term frequency. That's just the count of how often the word appears in the document, maybe normalized by the number of total words in the document, right? It's, it not, it's not really scary. Inverse document frequency is more interesting. That is basically how often does that word appear in documents across the set? So if it appears in every document, it might not be worth as much as something that appears in half the documents, right? So here's some Python code that kind of codes up those concepts, and we can do some calculations. And we can say, OK, if we have 200 total documents, and the word the appears in 199, and the word tensor in three, right? And that's not the, that's just, if a document, if a word appears once in the document, we count it. If it appears more times, it still only gets counted once. And then we you know, have these documents right here. And if we calculate these out, we can see that the, even though it appears a lot more, gets weighted down. So it's not worth as much as tensor is. And that's because of the word weighting. Okay. So uh, skip that, because that's what we really want to see. And what this shows you is this is how often the do how many documents the word appears in. And this is the weighting it's calculating for it. And as you can see, if it appears in all the document, or I'm sorry, if it appears in like one document, that word is worth a lot. But as, you, as it appears in more and more documents, it quickly drops off until it's not worth very much. And this will essentially kind of also take care of words like the and a and all those words that appear a lot in any document. However, in a practical sense, it's better to just remove the stop words first because you're just doing a lot of calculation on stuff that's going to be discounted. So, so uh, let's go back to the idea of browsability. Um, what we really want to say is that if we have a shelf, the items next to each other in the shelf should be close, right? They should have this closeness in the topic space. And if everything holds true for all of the items, then we'll consider that browsable, right? Okay. And given that definition, can we find documents which are close? We could cluster them. That's interesting. That happens all the time. You you've cast these documents as vectors, and we can cluster vectors, and we can find those clusters. But that's not really what we're trying to do here, because we want to arrange them on a shelf, which is in a 1D line, and maintain that property of browsability across all the documents. right? So here's another formula. It's really small. I'm sorry about that. Um, basically, what we want to do is walk the shelf and compare the distance from each document to its neighbor. And as we walk the shelf, we want to minimize that complete, that total distance. So I'm going to introduce another concept. This is an older uh, machine learning thing called the self-organizing map, invented by Kahonen. And we can visualize this. So there's this cool thing. If you're using Jupyter, you can use these um, grids to basically show like a, you can create a grid of blocks and show it. And so rather than talk about topic spaces, we'll talk about color spaces, because that's a lot easier for humans to visualize. And we're going to create a, basically a set of books, right? So this is our set of books. I hope you can all see the colors. I know it probably is small. And Let's just say that we're, we want our shelves to look good, so we're going to arrange them by the color of their spines. right? And we want a nice, smooth gradation of spine color. Okay. 
So we're going to take our shelf, and this is what our shelf starts out. So we'll just say, well, what I do is I just take the color of my book, and I match it to the closest color on the shelf, and that's how we'll arrange them. But you can see this shelf isn't really great. It's got a lot of blacks, and it doesn't seem to, there's no smooth gradation. So a self-organizing map works like this. This is, is a pretty simple algorithm. I'm going to take a book. I'm going to match it to the closest color, say over here, put the book down on the shelf. And then I'm going to move the color on the shelf closer to the color of the book. And then I'm going to walk this way, and this one will be moved closer to that color a little less because we're a little further away. And then this one will be moved closer to that color. Da, 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 da. We'll go through and do it this way. And then we're going to take the next book. So we'll take that book off the shelf. Then we'll take the next book, and we'll put it on the shelf. And we'll keep doing that over and over and over and over. I think this one was set up, I ran it about 30,000 times. And this is what we get. So here's the books, and here's what the shelf ends up. And you can see that what we had is this mostly smooth gradation of color created. And that's, that's the self-organizing map algorithm. And that would allow us to maybe put the spines down here, and then we would get a mostly smooth gradation of the spine colors on the shelf. Now, if in your mind you remove color and you put in topic model, which is basically those word counts that have been weighted. We Each node um, uh, in our self-organizing map. Oh, we can use that? OK. Is it cool? All right. Never mind. So in each node in the self-organizing map would correspond to a shelf location. And we can actually map them to physical locations. And we can just put our documents or books there. And so I did a quick demo of this. Let's see if this works. Um, so. The reason I'm interested in this is I have lots of documents that I look at. And so for example, here, let's go through this quick. We can see that, uh, let's see. All right, so 
These documents are talking about things like words and embeddings, and so they're linked to each other. They're on the same sort of location. These are locations. And as we go down through this list, it's going to change from topic to topic. And what this allows you to do is you can go in and say, well, I have multiple documents that talk about the same thing. I can read them all together and maybe get a better covering of that topic than I would if I had to go through and read each book separately and then find that. So let's go back. Oh my gosh. Uh-oh. Don't worry. Oh boy. Um, I lost my pointer. We'll just recap this. <laughs> oh, man. OK. It's a lot. Yeah. OK, there we go. That would have been a great idea. And what's interesting is we can always generate a shelving that, and for any given document set that maintains our browsability. And even for it, because it's a semi-random algorithm, it can produce multiple different shelvings that maintain that. Um, what if two documents map to the same node? That can be a problem. And it's not universal. This totally depends on the source documents. And we could use only nouns, only verbs, or we could remove proper nouns. The reason I bring that up is anything that was produced by Google tends to have Google in it, and so it likes to group things produced by Google. All right, and that's it. Questions? What do you do with people with negatives? Uh, negative, negative. Uh, this has no, it doesn't, because it's dealing with a topic, mm -hmm. There's. it's really hard to s deal with a not a topic, like, so it doesn't deal with anything like that. So there's a uh, question of perspective. So a scientific community talks about judging, so using sympathetic words, and the average Joe Schmo knows about the string subject. Um, so we could end up using our quizzes reset to different topic areas. OK, so the, the question is, if you have uh, perspective, if you have two different kinds of people talking about the same subject, um, what would what would happen essentially? So it would really depend. It's totally dependent on the vocabulary. So if they're using a different vocabulary, it would tend to put them further apart. If they're using the same vocabulary, it would tend to put them closer together. Um, this uh, this happens like in another problem is like in financial documents. They might talk about securities or a security as opposed to a system where they're talking about securing a website, and so. The word security is in both, but it means two very different things. So that's kind of the reverse problem, like what happens then? And that depends a lot on context. And that's actually an open problem, even if you're using word vectors, about how you deal with the fact that a word can mean different things in different contexts. There's another hand back there. Um, boy, off, not off the top of my head. There's um, some Python natural language toolkit books they're really good. Um, I think some of them are actually open source now. Like you can go and pull down the text off the web. Um, yeah, that's. I a lot of the documents you saw there were like I went out and got a humble bundle of all these machine processing things, and I wrote some software that split the PDFs up into chapters so I could run this analysis on it. But yeah, there's there's tons of actual like websites and books to let you go in and play around with this stuff. So. Any other questions we have about five minutes? Yeah. How does the TFIDS factor compare to like the worst effect of effect? Is the worst effect always better, quote unquote? So a word to vec vector deals with the context of a word itself. And it gives you meaning for the word based on the context. A TFIDF vector is across a whole document. And so it deals with sort of the, the macro level of what that document means. And that's really the difference between them. Yeah, they're different tools. You're, you're looking at entirely different things.
Any other questions? Bueller? Oh. Um, I haven't put it online. I could. It's it's not. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. The code you saw here is just like a tip of, of everything that I wrote. But any other questions? Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's more like this is an interesting problem. Um, the, there are already like different classification systems, like the Library of Congress has its own classification system. Um, but it, it's an interesting problem because if you think about how books are arranged on a shelf, it lends itself to a lot of information processing problems or even computer science problems about how you deal with how things are close together. So it was more just like, oh, that, that's interesting, but how could, I, how could I make it, you know, how could I apply what I know to make it better? I don't know if this is better. I don't know if librarians would appreciate something that rearranges the books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you.